Okay, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We weren't expecting such a big um, venue and such a big crowd, so we're really honoured. My name's Talia. I'm an Agile coach from South Africa, Johannesburg. And then by night, my side company is doing graphic recording and visuals. So this is what I love. Hi everyone, my name is Angie Doyle. I'm also an Agile coach from South Africa. Uh, Talia briefly touched on it. We weren't expecting such a big um, <laughs> room. So we, there, there are a difference in the booklets. Um, Agile India very kindly helped us with generating some more booklets that are at the back. Um, but don't worry, the booklets are available for download afterwards. So if you didn't get a color copy, you can print one out. Okay, so we will be tweeting out the link a little bit later. Okay. okay, awesome. So welcome. I hope everyone's got their, their drawing hands ready and nimble. Did everybody um, know that this was a drawing workshop? You know you're going to be drawing, right? <laughs> Please don't leave. It's fun. Okay. <laughs> just checking. Okay, so maybe just to set the scene a bit. Um, this workshop is geared towards using visual techniques, so visual thinking techniques, for team communication. So it's not about being an amazing artist, it's not about perfection, it's about equipping you with some techniques and some practice so that hopefully when you go back to your teams, you'll have the confidence to pick up a pen and to use it in your, in your collaboration. So I just want to know by show of hands, how many of you were once children? <laughs> Please help me out. everyone. Yeah? Hoping everyone's got the hand. How many of you loved to draw as a child? Yeah, a lot of, lot of hands still up. How many of you still love to draw? Yeah, so we've we got quite a couple of artists. So just like Talia said, we're introducing you to the basics. If you are a modern day Da Vinci, uh, you can probably come up and join <laughs> us just now and help us go through some of the basic concepts. For the rest of you that are a little bit nervous about drawing, you're going to grab a pen and we're going to draw something together. This is going to be the hardest thing you are going to do the whole day. You're going to follow my instructions. So open up your booklet so, on the first yeah. page. It says your drawing here. If you don't have a booklet, grab some blank paper because I don't think every seat has a booklet. And you're going to follow exactly what I do. Okay. Oh, it's hard working with a microphone in one hand. Okay, in the middle of your page, you are going to draw a nice big square, just like this. Nice big square. Okay, you got your big square in the middle. Yep. That's the win. Then you're going to draw a really big half circle at the top. And then you're going to draw a medium circle, next half circle next to it. Can everyone see? Maybe just maneuver around so you can see. Yeah, it's going to be hard to position the flip chart. And then next to it, a little smaller half circle. Okay. On the right-hand side of the block, you're going to do a funny upside, like angled triangle. Next to it, you're going to do a slightly smaller one, and next to it, a slightly smaller one. Know what we got so far? At the top here, on the top left-hand side of your block, you're going to draw a nice big triangle. Over here, a smaller triangle just underneath it. You're going to do a, a little bit like this design, these semicircles. You're going to do a small one, a slightly bigger one, and a bigger one from the top right to the bottom left. Anybody got an idea of what we're drawing so far? You're going to draw a big circle there in the top left. And in that circle, you're going to draw a smaller circle. You're going to color that one in. And then just at the bottom, you're going to give your chicken some feet. And all of you should have something that looks 
like this. I'll do it. You got an agile chicken? Hey. Everybody got an agile chicken? I feel like one of those like showgirls. <laughs> <laughs> Lift up your agile chickens. We want to see them. Yeah. If, oh, look at that. You all got a chicken. So you can draw. You can draw. <laughs> see, that is, the, that is the hardest thing you're going to do today. I promise. It's going to be the most intense thing. Okay. So we do know that it's quite a big room. If you can't see at any point, please feel free to kind of gravitate towards where we are. Oh, hello. Is that better? Okay. So if you can't see at any point, please feel free to just gravitate or stand up or, or move around. Okay. okay. Cool. So we're going to train from the back of the room today because we like to do things differently. And, and we also needed the wall space, so I'm sorry. Can everyone see this? Let's see this. Okay. We actually made this while we were here in India because the first thing we saw when we landed was all of these signs. Um, uh, who knows we, what we that don't, means? We don't have that in South Africa. That's not a sign we have. Okay, and it became very clear very quickly that that's like a no hooting, like no honking sign. We've still, we're still trying to find the place where people obey that sign. <laughs> we haven't found it. <laughs> Advisory, okay. It's a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, everywhere you go in the world, um, we use a lot of visuals, okay? And visuals actually transcend language and culture. So if you have a look next time you travel at just the signs and how easy it is to follow these signs without any language or words. So this is a nice example. This one was really important for me. I got that wrong on my first day in the hotel. <laughs> And because the signs here aren't super clear, which is why we decided to draw it there. It's really important to make sure that this looks like a lady. Anyway. <laughs> okay, and then this one at the bottom with the wine glass and the arrows pointing up. Uh, who knows what that means? Fragile, exactly. Fragile mm -hmm. this way up. It may not mean kind of this box is full of wine. Uh, usually in my case it does. <laughs> But again, I mean, what a clear indication that everyone understands universally. And these ones are pretty similar. So we've got the car that's kind of skidding on the road, implying that it's wet. And then we've got this one where a person's kind of skidding along the slippery floor as well. We always laugh because this always looks like there's snakes chasing someone. It's really <laughs> quite an interesting visual. Okay, but other than the snakes, it's pretty much universal, this visual language. So that's our whole point, is that you can use visuals to communicate, especially in like cross-cultural, cross-language situations and teams. But why visual thinking? Um, often I think people you know, think that we just like to draw, but there's a very specific purpose and kind of psychology behind it. So visual thinking helps you see the bigger picture. Often when we're thinking about things in our own heads, it's quite overwhelming. And with teams, it's quite difficult to communicate. So if you're able to map it out visually, you can actually put it into perspective and see a bigger picture for a problem or solution. Another thing that visual thinking does is it helps with engagement in a team. If you're actually actively involved in picking up a pen and participating, you're that much more engaged in what's actually happening in the session. And it also helps with different levels of thinking. So it helps you think strategically, it helps you think tactically, and it helps you think creatively. How much time do you think you can save in every meeting if you just include some visuals? Some of you can see the poster. For those of you at the back, how much time do you think it is? Does it help if I do this for you guys? Okay. Can you see it? You can save 24% of your meeting time that's wasted just in conversation just by including some visuals. Why do you think that is? I'm hearing lots of stuff. It's pretty much that we can have a common, a, a common picture. Otherwise, do you guys still have records? You know record players? Yeah? <laughs> Otherwise, you have like a record, it, like the conversation just goes on repeat because no one's actually recorded what was said. Or you're saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
And then also interestingly, so there are four modes of learning. So certain people learn better through different styles. So you've got your read-write, which is our very much like traditional schooling system. You've got visual, you've got auditory, and you've got, and you've got kinesthetic, which is movement. 65% um, of people are visual learners. And actually, I was doing a lot of reading up. It's actually increasing with the younger generations because there's so much more visual. If you think of like social media and videos and all of that. So it's really important to, to be able to incorporate this with your teams because chances are they're a good portion of your team who are visual learners. How were you guys taught at school? <laughs> were you more read and write? Yeah, your teachers forced you to write stuff down and read things to learn. And we've started seeing that education is starting to change to incorporate the other modes of learning as well. But particularly with my sort of generation, and even to an extent Talia's generation, we still see that people were taught to read and write and to ignore their other modes of learning. And the final thing, the final reason why we want to include visual thinking into our work when we work with teams is because we want to have a shared record. So when we walk out of our team sessions, we're pulling flip charts off the wall and we're taking them with us. So if we want to have another conversation a bit later, we just pull out those flip charts and we just keep building on it. You can't do that with PowerPoint. Okay. So it's an agile conference. So we had to include our own manifesto because it's compulsory at an agile conference. So we've come up with our own visual thinking manifesto, which is here. So our first, our first statement of value in visual thinking is thinking in pictures over explaining in words. So words are still important, but they're not enough. We need to start bringing in a way to communicate in pictures. Now, in South Africa, we have 11 official languages. So when we're sitting in a room and we have 11 different official languages, words are definitely not going to be enough. We have to figure out how do we include visual elements to you. Cool. And then our second value is shared understanding over individual interpretation. So again, it's about teamwork, being able to actually communicate something effectively to a group of people and not just keep it in your head. Um, and visuals can help do that really quickly and really easily. Our third statement is see possibilities over analyzing problems. Are you ever in sessions where all you're hearing is problems? That's all that people see. We never kind of get to that solution space. And starting to incorporate visuals into your conversation can help others start seeing the possibilities behind the problems. Problems also sometimes seem a lot bigger, you know, if they're just in your head. Okay, and then the last one is embrace humanness over seeking precision. So the first batch of posters Angie and I did, we actually had a spelling mistake in this. Uh, we didn't know how to spell humanness, or I don't know. <laughs> we had one N, and someone picked it up, and we were like, yeah, that was intentional. We just, <laughs> we're trying to prove a point that it doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> we fixed it now, though. <laughs> okay, so this is about, it's not about perfection, it's not about art. It's actually about being open and being courageous and authentic and trying. So if you draw something and it's imperfect, it actually becomes like a really humorous memory for you and your team, um, which is better. People remember that more than a really perfect symmetrical icon on PowerPoint. Okay, so we want to actually embrace that human element. People also connect better generally with hand-drawn images because of that, because it's interesting. It's not like just something that they've seen all the time. And if it's imperfect, they're actually more likely to pick up a pen and go and contribute than if it was perfect. So if it I'm doesn't sure look, I don't know, like an artwork, they'll actually come and contribute more. Okay, mm -hmm. And you cannot pick up a pen and go and correct a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if anybody wrote on these whiteboard things that all the presentations have been, pro have been projected onto, there'd be a lot of trouble. So <laughs> just by having it hand-drawn, you're actually going to encourage more collaboration with people. 
So Talia has just walked to our agenda. For those of you that haven't seen it yet, this is just a very simple way to keep things visual. It's just to help you know where we are in the workshop. So we're about to dive into a little bit more of a practical explanation. So this has been quite theoretical. You're going to follow along in your books with us. So we're going to introduce the first element of visual thinking, which might be surprising for you because it's actually letters. It's how do you write words? Now, if you, how many of you have got amazing handwriting? How many of you got like awesome handwriting? No, there's a few people putting up their hands. The rest of you, how's your handwriting? A little bit dodgy, so, so, yeah. And it's a problem, right? Because if you're gonna be standing up in front of a team and you're going to be recording stuff on a flip chart for them, you've gotta have a really, really neat handwriting. But don't worry, we're gonna help you get a better, more legible handwriting. So the way to do it is to start off with a grid like this. So you can see that there's five lines on here. And you're gonna use these middle three lines for the bulk of your lettering. So I'm gonna try to do this with a mic in my hand at the same time. Does anyone have a spare book? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna do a letter A here. Okay, did you see what I just did there? I used the three letters in the middle for my letter. If I'm doing something with the tail at the top, so something like a B, I'm gonna use the three in the middle and use that top part there for the top. Let's do a C. And now the trick with writing is you've always gotta leave enough space between your words. If you write too closely together, no one's gonna see what you've written from a distance. So a good idea is between your letters is to leave a space the size of a letter M. Okay, and then you can keep writing. See, there's a letter with a tail. Oops, we've got a very uneven wall here, Talia. Oh. Okay, practice that one very quickly. Practice a nice, neat font in your book using the space provided. Write your name. Do you want to maybe hold it for that side? Do you guys have sweet books? Can you guys, can you guys see on that side? Yeah? Pardon? Uh, small's nice because it's got a tail and it's got a top as well. Or you can so I don't know if you also saw what I did with my A. I gave it a little, um, a little cap on the top. Yeah, That's just so that it doesn't look like a U or like a small b or something like that. It just makes it very clearly distinct from other letters. Uh, just very quickly, does anyone have any spare books? There were some people. Okay. If you don't have a book, just follow along on some blank paper. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, here's one. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Oh, here we go. There's Thank a few. You. Okay, has everybody got Post their it. name? Everybody written their name? Some of you have got really long names. Okay, so once you've got a really, really clear, legible font that you can write super quick, because the idea with this is you need to be able to write fast and neat. So you've actually got to practice this. It's not good that you can write fast. You've got to read, it's got to be in a way that other people can actually read what you said. Once you've got a really nice, clear font, then you can start doing something like super fancy. What does this say? Those of you at the front that can read it. It says fancy, okay, fancy font. Don't write in fancy font when you are taking notes for other people, okay. <laughs> They're not going to be able to read it. You know when you can use fancy font? For the headings. Okay, so if you are preparing for a workshop or something beforehand for your team, you can play around with some fun elements. And you'll see we do it quite a lot with our posters just to give you some ideas. Okay, everybody got, maybe do a quick fancy font in the bottom one. Okay, 
Now we're going to move on. You've mastered lettering. Now you're going to move on to connectors. This is something I promise you every single one of you can do. So we, we like connectors and separators. So connectors are really lines, lines and arrows. So they're good to connect two ideas to each other. So it's as simple as just drawing a line from one idea to the other idea. How do you usually use this line, like a straight line? It's just to show a relationship, right? What about if I do this? What does that mean? So it's now a dotted line. Sort of connected, maybe like a dotted line reporting. So it's not a direct connection, it's like a distant cousin kind of connection. What about if it's like this? So it's a super, super thick line. Strong connection, right? Just using a line, like you can come up with three different meanings. Now another way that we can use connectors or lines is to highlight an idea, just by underlining it. Like you all do that already. When something's important, you underline it. But you can also use lines to make something glow off the page just by highlighting like that. Another way to use lines is to actually keep it, to keep ideas separate from each other. And we do that by drawing a line around something to box the idea in. And I mentioned that we don't just use lines, we also use arrows, because what are arrows really important for? to draw attention to something on a page. So instantly when you see an arrow, where are you looking? To wherever the arrowhead is pointing. Okay, super simple. You guys do these already, right? So now we're gonna move on to something that maybe is a little bit more hectic. How do you, how do you like drawing people? Easy. Hmm? Easy, <laughs> it is easy. It's super easy to draw people. Like, all you need to do is just draw strict stick men, right? So how, what's your favorite way to draw people? Stick men. Stick oh, it's men, mine. Yeah. Mine as well. Or as Talia says, stick ladies as well. Yeah, stick men and ladies. It's important. <laughs> okay, you're just normal. Your circle with your little <laughs> arms and legs. Super, super simple. The one that I quite like is um, if you're in a rush and you need to draw people really quickly. So this is good if you're working in user experience and you need to represent that there's people that you're engaging with. Um, and if it's a fast drawing, you can draw a little star man. And he looks, okay, he looks a little bit strange because this wall's weird to draw on. So he's got a really fat leg and a thin leg. But you can see he's a person, right? The other one I love is this one and you'll see it on all the posters that I've drawn. Can you see that? He's like a little chess piece. He's got like the little head and like a little half circle body. And the reason I like this one is because you can actually add arms and legs. And he can actually, he's kind of standing there, kind of saying what now. Um, a good way to represent a crowd, so again, if you're having to draw something really quickly, so if I was gonna draw you, this is one way I might do it. So just a whole bunch of these little chess piece men next to, get next to each other, and then you draw the heads afterwards. And then, oh, this one, this one's pretty cool. Oh, Talia, you're gonna battle <laughs> on this wall. Our pictures are gonna be very imperfect, because this is Very imperfect, we're, nice. we're living our one manifesto value. Okay, so we just got another little crowd there. My other favorite, in addition to this little chess piece guy, is just drawing little, little box men. So they're great when you're trying to give movement or an angle that someone's facing. So this guy over here, you draw his head first and a neck, and you position his body in the direction that he's going. So what do you think this guy's doing? He's running, right? Okay, that is a speed cloud. <laughs> Just making it clear, and I'll put like little sweat drops coming off of him. Okay, so just a couple of, a, a few simple shapes. 
can get you Let's some movement with your people. Okay. So Ooh. Talia, you're going to draw a person. Okay. Oh, yeah. Talia's going to do a little motion that you're going to copy. So, so you want to maybe watch things around you and find like movements or expressions that you can draw. So I think in there we said draw someone jumping. I can't really jump that well, but maybe like I that. hold it. So draw, Talia, just hold the pose so that they can quickly just... If only I could like <laughs> stay in mid-air, that would be better. But. So practice drawing someone jumping. It's in the bottom right-hand corner, I think, of your booklet. So just quickly practice using any of the characters we've just been through, but that little square guy is really easy for movement. Everybody got someone jumping. Hey, was it easy? Cool. Now that, yeah, easier than if you hadn't tried, hey? There you go. <laughs> we went to uh, Mysore uh, on Saturday. We did a tour. And Talia did a jump just like that. <laughs> so you know those embarrassing photographs that you take like in front of, you know, when you're a tourist? And I tried to do a jump. I was probably this far off the ground. <laughs> it was really embarrassing, but nice photo. Okay, so has everyone drawn a person? Okay, now that we know how to draw people, what's the next thing? Oh, actually, you guys can look in your book, so it's not a surprise. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on to faces. Now, why is it important to draw faces? I mean, we're in technology, like why? Personas, emotion. Okay, awesome, because actually at the end of the day, whatever we develop is for people. And it's really important to capture that emotion. How is a person feeling? Are they happy? Are they sad? Okay, so we want to take the fear out of drawing faces. They're really easy ways of doing it. Um, so for example, for the eyes, you can just do like a, a circle. Uh, you can almost do like a W for a nose. Um, so those of you that can't see, it's really hard for us to lift up and show. Just move around if you want yeah. to. Okay. Another, this is my favorite way to draw eyes. It's pretty much just like a colored in circle. And then I put like a semi circle on top, which looks like the eyelid. And a nose you could even do just as a straight line. That's super quick. Uh, if you want to get a bit more fancy, and now I'm on the crack, so let's see. You can do like a semi circle. Uh, with another colored in circle in the corner, if he's looking that way, which gives you more of like a cartoon kind of eye. Um, and then a V for the nose. So at the moment, how are these people feeling? You can't tell, right? Neutral, okay, good point. So actually most of our emotion comes from our eyebrows and from our mouths. Um, so, if we did this to this girl, how is she feeling now? Sad, confused. Okay. Can you see on and this side? Should we lift it up quick? Angry. Okay, so traditionally the eyebrow is pointing down and the, yeah. Uh, this guy, shame, he's got a bit of a unibrow. Um, happy, but then his eyebrows are just straight. So like naughty, I don't know. Like oh, he's he looks hiding like a goofball. Something. He looks very goofy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because he's got one eyebrow. I know. <laughs> okay, so that's a really quick and easy way to show emotion without actually needing any artistic ability. Um, and this actually comes from a technique that we use by Dave Gray, um, and it's called a face grid. So essentially, all we're doing is using three lines um, for the eyebrows and the mouths, and we're able to create nine expressions. So your lines at the top here are your eyebrows, and your lines down the side are your mouths. Um, I think it is in your book, or you can follow on a piece of paper. Yeah, draw it in your book as you go. Follow along with Talia. So basically, all I'm doing is I'm saying eyebrows from the top. So all of these will actually be like that, and then mouth 
Oh, shame. He's drooling. Okay. <laughs> okay, so all the eyebrows and then all the mouths. So basically, once you've done this, you've got nine really unique expressions that you can use, that you can reference. And then if you're feeling really creative, you can start mixing an ab yeah. so with I think the different the, eyes and the nose. Yeah. So you can really build up this face grid to pretty much create any emotion. And there are some ideas in the booklet as well. Okay, great, so you're comfortable with faces. Awesome. So now that we've mastered people, we're going to pretty much tackle everything else in the world, which is like all your objects or anything else you want to draw. And there's also a trick with this. So the trick is to break everything down into its most basic shape. Um, actually, professional artists, this is also how they start. They'll start with like the basic and then add a whole bunch of awesome stuff on top. But the aim with this is you want to be able to draw things with as few lines um, and as simply as possible. Because remember, it's not about artwork, it's about just getting a concept across, an idea of an object or something. So for example, uh, and this blew my mind, so your basic shapes are your squares and rectangles, circles, triangles, and then lines, so your squiggles. Um, so I always had issues drawing a puzzle piece because I'd kind of go like around the edge and try. And, and you'd be surprised how often you draw puzzle pieces with yeah. visual thinking. It's like, because it, it means so much yeah. or it could mean so much. Could mean like teams working together. It could mean like anything. And actually when you break a puzzle piece down, it's pretty much just a square with four circles. So a square and then kind of in the middle of each side, you're going to draw, you're going to visualize a circle and then all you do, all you do is just trace around it. So you're going to trace around the square and then for some of them you might go in and for some of them you might go out. That's it. Easy. Okay, another one um, which I use often, so there are actually like a few things that Angie and I use all the time, um, is a light bulb. So pretty much a light bulb is a circle and like a rectangle. Um, and then obviously you can just make it look prettier with two lines, a squiggle, and then like Angie mentioned earlier, you can use lines to make it glow, to accentuate it. Um, if you want to get fancier, you almost just separate the rectangle and the circle and just follow that curve. So there's a bottom, you're going to follow the curve around, which gives you that nice kind of um, hourglass or curvaceous shape. And then you can add a little semicircle at the bottom. And this is the kind of stuff that you can use for so many things, strategy, ideas, innovation. So it's almost like learning an, another language. Um, and then also, for example, triangle, you can very easily draw something like a fish using two triangles and some circles. Um, and super quick and easy, I think your flip charts are slightly different from ours, but with one, two, three, four, five lines, you've got a flip chart. Okay, so again, it's about kind of looking at something and really breaking it down into the bare minimum lines and the bare minimum shapes. So we're going to give you, impression. we're going to give you an opportunity to practice with the basic shapes because this is probably the hardest one to do. So you'll see in the middle of your tables, there's two tables that do not have a colorful envelope. Those two tables just come and find another table to work with, but have a look in those big colorful envelopes. This one over here, big folder, you can hold it up for me. Okay, inside of it, there's a whole bunch of shapes. And we've also got pipe cleaners for those lines. Empty it all out into the middle of your table. And we're going to give you five minutes as a table to build as many objects as you can with the shapes that are in there. 
The okay. team who makes the most wins. <laughs> so be creative. Really think about what the shapes are in different objects. Two minutes to finish up all the shapes on your table. Take a quick look at what the tables around you did. We'll give you a minute to do like a walking tour of the room. Okay, so take a quick look at the tables around you and see some of the objects that they came up with. So we'll give you like another 30 seconds to do that. Okay, you can start heading back to your table. Okay, how did you guys find that? Easy. Awesome, that's good. How easy was it to create your objects? Not easy? Not, that, not hard, right? Oh. When you break things down into their basic shapes, it is really easy to start drawing things. Yeah. What have we done in the past? We've always tried to make it look like it's real. Okay. Some people say it's not easy, and yeah, it takes a bit of practice. So what you can do is you can actually look around your home or your office and identify objects and find ways of drawing them quickly or, you know, what, sh what shapes they're made up of. Okay, grab a seat back at your table. We're going to keep going through the rest of the elements. We'll just give you guys an opportunity to sit down. So what I do with my daughter, uh, she really loves to draw. And we've actually got a journal and we just draw big, like a big grid on a page and then we'll go into a room in the house and we'll pick out ob objects and say, okay, let's draw that. And then all we'll use is basic shapes. The trick with the basic shapes is to use as few lines as possible. So you want to get to a point where you can draw these things really, really quickly. So it does take a bit of practice, but it helps when you just break it down into the, its simplest form. Okay, so we're going to move on. So now that we've got our basic sh shapes and our objects and we, we're happy with that, we're going to move on to the next section. Just a quick note, you can do a lot with the elements we've covered so far. You can do a lot with connectors and lines and with stick people and like really basic, basic things. Um, this section, containers, you can get quite creative with or you can keep it simple. So I mean this, yeah, it's more kind of about using it to illustrate meaning. So for example, the trick with uh, containers is to always do your text first. So you'll write whatever you want to write and then you'll contain it. So like Angie did maybe just with a block. Okay, because the risk is if you do your container first, let's do maybe like a little speech bubble. Awesome, it's so pretty. Now I want to write the word conversation and you're like standing up there and everyone's watching you and you're really confident and you're like, converse, and then you're like, now I'm out of space. And then you try and like fit the rest of it into that last little piece. Okay, so it's just like a really practical way is to always do your text first and then contain it afterwards because then you can always just make it fit. Um, what I like to do 
which is a really easy kind of thing. It's like the conversation maybe in a speech bubble. Um, sometimes if it's something that we're talking about that's maybe like a thought or a feeling of a customer, for example, um, I'll use a thought bubble container to contain that, that text, that thought or that feeling. So already, you almost start to develop like a language with your teams because you know everything in a thought bubble means it's certain information, it's a feeling or, or whatever, or thought. Um, my favorite is also like banners. Um, Angie and I use, use them quite often for our posters. So they're really nice just for headings um, and they're actually quite easy to do. So my favorite one is like a very curvy one. So it's almost like an S and then a backwards S. Um, and then you'll bring it down into like a rectangle. Um, and then you'll join at the back, kind of where it goes behind, you'll create like another rectangle. Just make sure that it's always the same width as the front. Otherwise it looks like it doesn't belong. Um, you can also do like a, what do you call it? Like a triangular edge. And then all you do is connect it where the S was, you just draw a line down. And that gives the illusion of it being 3D. Um, another really basic one would be kind of square. You can do a square box, a square box behind, and then you just do a line to join. So that's a really like simple way of making something look quite cool. What do you think the difference is between your really like curvy um, shapes versus your more rectangular pointy edges? Like wavy? Okay. And in terms of like the meaning behind it, like the psychology behind it? Softer? Softer. More organic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, and do you see how intuitive it is for us to say if something's in a more like curvy container, it's softer, it's less structured, whereas the very strong edges are very rigid. It's maybe a rule, not a suggestion. Who was saying earlier signs or suggestions? Um, and again, your team will start to understand that and you can actually build it in as like a, a language that you use. Um, I'm going to break my own rule. So the only time that I'll do the container first is if you're really maybe having fun uh, or you don't have a lot of text. So here's a coffee cup. Again, just like a half circle and two lines. Um, and then you could put text in there to fit the shape. You know, so you can do like really fun stuff quite simply with containers. There's some ideas in the book as well, like frames and and there's lots on Google as well if you want to practice and explore. Okay, so we've now done all those basic shapes and now we're at the point where we can start adding things like color and shading. But the tip with this is always start with these elements first. So color and shading is really great to add in, uh, but not if you don't have time. So rather focus on these things and start adding in things like containers, colors, shading after. Otherwise you land the risk of actually losing as you go because you're trying to make it look too beautiful. Remember it's all about visual thinking, getting the mm. team onto the same page. And sometimes less is more. Less Sorry, is Angie. always yeah, more with visual like... thinking. So we've just got a plain old simple color wheel. We don't have a poster for it. Um, the trick with color is to understand the local references to color. So there could be different colors and we wouldn't know necessarily from a cultural side what different colors imply. So make sure you are aware of color and the use of color. Um, I know in a lot of our sessions in South Africa, we would limit the color black that we use. So we would use black font, but we wouldn't necessarily use a lot of black shading. Um, it, yeah, I mean, we're also we're a very colorful nation. So that's not going to be the kind of color we'd bring in a lot of. Also, um, one thing, sorry, Angie, just on that. So how many of you use RAG or have used RAG statuses in the past? Red, amber, Your red, green. amber, green. So just be careful of the psychology behind that. I've often like picked up a red marker just because it was there and written stuff and people have walked in and they're like, what's wrong? 
everything's red, you know, because <laughs> it's so entrenched. So there's a lot of like psychology behind color as well. Okay. And then also just be aware of what colors go really well together. So you want to know which ones are complementary. Our posters have no color scheme. Okay. So Talia and I went for maximum color. <laughs> But when we're facilitating or when we are doing a graphic facilitation session, we don't incorporate this much color. We'll often actually go with the company's corporate color schemes, especially if there's a lot of connection in the company with the corporate branding. Then we'll just make sure that we've got the markers in that color and those are the only ones that we'll use. Otherwise, it can be like a bit visually overwhelming. It's different for this kind of workshop, but if you're, if you're doing graphic recording, keep it a little bit simpler. Okay. So the next thing that we want to move on to is shading. So this is what we're going to do after we've actually done our basic shapes. And there's a couple of different ways that you can incorporate some shading into your, into your graphic facilitation or into your visual thinking. So the easiest one is to use lines. We've got lines on our shirt just to indicate that there's depth in there. So that's cross-hatching. So you can either use crossed lines. I just like to use a simple one line. But can you see I've got a, a light, a desk light, in the top right-hand corner of this poster. So it implies that there's a light source coming from the top right-hand corner. So what's going to happen here is the lines are going to be quite close together in the bottom left-hand corner. And as you start getting closer to the light source, they're going to get further and further away. So it looks like it's darker here and lighter there. The trick with shading is never to confuse where the light source is coming from. So if you're shading and it's darker in the bottom left-hand corner, keep the shading in the bottom left-hand corner because visually we know it looks wrong. So just always, in my mind, the sun's always on the top right-hand corner, so that's how I always shade. Uh, stippling, this one is really amazing if you have the time to sit and do a lot of dots. It's actually a really incredible effect. So this one's pretty cool if you're doing something like sketch noting and you've got time to add color afterwards, you'll do the same thing. Lots and lots of dots in the bottom left-hand corner and then it'll fade up to the top right. The one that you've seen us use a lot on our posters, can you see the color that we've incorporated, the crayon? Can you see the crayon? So, I'm just trying to find mine. So we use these crayons which is basically, it's just like a block of crayon. And then what you do is you just shade. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it on the wall, but I'm going to try. So you start really, really dark in the bottom left-hand corner, but it's a really fast way of injecting some color into your posters. Okay, rather, otherwise you're going to go through so much ink with your markers, so these things are really great to buy for shading. Okay. So are you ready to start drawing? Are we going to do it? We're going to draw again. Are you ready? We're going to play something called Visual Jam. So find that page in your book. It is a two by three grid. And it's going to have, can I use yours? Can I lift it up? That's what it looks like. Okay, grab yourself a pen, and how Visual Jam works is I'm gonna call out some words. I've got a whole bunch of words that I know teams use all the time. And I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to draw that word. Okay, using particularly what you've just learned under basic shapes. And Tyler. this one, sorry Angie, this one you don't have to do in your book. You can use any paper that's on the table. You're basically just going to divide it into six. Okay, Sorry. so here's my words. Talia's actually going to draw it at the same time. Like I said, I'm going to give you 30 seconds around there per word, and we're going to see how you guys do. Are you ready? Use basic shapes, use connectors. You can even incorporate words if you want to. Use any of the elements that we've just been through to help you out with this drawing. Are you ready? Talia, are you ready? I hope so. I don't know what the words are. <laughs> Let me pick one. Okay, let's go with management. Management.
You're about halfway through. Okay, that's 30 seconds for management. This is how quick we've got to be. Next word, let's do passion. 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 Passionate. So you can draw passion or passionate. I'm okay with either of those to you. As in passionate about visual thinking. Yeah, please keep it maybe <laughs> PG. <laughs> PG. <laughs> Almost up. Next word. Strategy. Strategy. Times up. Next word, metrics or measurements. Metrics or measurements. Metric or measurement. Got about five seconds left. Next word is feedback. Hmm. Feedback. When you give feedback to someone else. Okay, last word. I'm going to make it a good one. Transformation. Oh. Oh, you always hear this word in Agile. You've got to love it. You've got to have a picture <laughs> for it. It's the word you're going to hear in every meeting. Transformation. Okay, time is up. Are you ready? Because what you're going to do is you're going to hold up your pictures and you're going to show everyone what you do because you've got to get comfortable with your drawings in public. got to hold them up, show them out. <laughs> Come on, don't be shy, just do it. Got to get the courage. Look at that. Look at those awesome images. Don't get intimidated by Talia's. I'm sure that they're beautiful, but Talia's been doing this for years. Cool. Well done, well done. How does that feel? How does it feel? Feel good? Like the hey, maybe a little bit more practice than some of them? I'm seeing amazing drawings. They're, they look incredible. Okay. 
So do you want to have an opportunity to build it up a little bit more and practice a little bit more of what we did today? Because now we've broken, I don't know, the nervousness. Everybody want to take a look at Talia's quick, because I want to give you a heads up with Talia. Okay. Talia has done this for two years. Two years. Okay. She has got that vocabulary in her head. So when she hears words, she knows exactly what she wants to draw. But you're welcome to come up at any point and come take a photo of Talia's if you want some inspiration for your stuff. But the trick with this is to draw what resonates with you. What does the word sound like to you? Not what does someone else draw it like. What does it sound like to you? And what can you draw? And a good way to do these, these, these very quick images is to look at icons on Google. Mm. So if you're not sure how to draw something, look at an icon. It's usually the simplest representation of it. And share and look at other people's work as well. So already now walking around, I've got other ideas. So next time I've got different things I could have used that might have actually been better, you know. So if you keep sharing, you'll keep learning. Okay, so we're going to move into the big practical section. Oh, we haven't been very good with our agenda. Let's just do that quick. So we're here. We're now in the, the big practical. What you're going to do at your tables is you can do a really, really big table poster if you want to. Um, the, the problem with too large a group is that half of you won't have a pen in your hand and you're just going to watch your buddies drawing. That's not what we want. We want everybody to have a pen in their hand and to play around with coming up with a poster. So you can split your table. A good size is usually about three to four people per group, so we'll leave you guys to self-organize around that. There should be some flip chart paper on the tables. There's some markers. You can mix and match with other tables because you're not going to have all the colors you're looking for. And a good way to start with this is to start with a small piece of paper first. Okay, so give me a small piece. So this is like a small scale of a flip chart. So what you do is you fold. Please help me talk with yes, my, okay. Sorry. So you're gonna fold it in half, and you're gonna fold it in half again, and you're gonna fold it in half again. And what you land up with is a miniature scale of a flip chart. So you can quickly sketch out, and then you can make it bigger. Okay, this is a good way to kind of plot out if you're wanting to do posters like what we've done. This is how we start. So you plan on a small scale, and then all you have to do is scale it up using this grid. So you know in the top left, right grid, that's what should be in it, etc., etc. Just so that you don't run out of space or anything on your big poster. So we're going to give you most of the time that's left for this workshop. We'll give you an idea of how we're tracking on time. But form your groups, come up with some concepts, and if you're stuck for what to draw, we've got a whole bunch of ideas here. So we've got the four statements of the Agile Manifesto, we've got the 12 principles, and we've got the, uh, the, um, the dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni. So if you want to come and grab one and draw that, you can draw anything though. These are just if you may be stuck at your table for some inspiration. So come grab us if you want one of them, we can show you what we've got. Otherwise, start forming your groups and we will let you know how time is moving. Also feel free, so Angie and I put a lot of effort into our posters so they can act as inspiration. Feel free to come and have a closer look, get some ideas, um, and just move around freely. Okay. You take off, I take off. Yeah. It's, you've got about seven or eight minutes.
What? Yeah, let's do it. But if we keep going, we're going to run over our time slot. So finish off what you're doing. You've got about 20 seconds. Also, if you have your shapes on the table, please could you do us a favor and just pack them up back in the folders? <laughs> So wherever you got to for now is fine. Hopefully it got the juices flowing and you'll continue practicing. So we are great. Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. So okay. what we're going to do is we're actually going to find somewhere to stick these up on the walls outside so you can see what everybody did. But we just want to wrap up the session because we're about to run out of time. Um, and Talia and I will be available just now. But maybe just quickly grab a seat and let's just finish off the last few, few things to bear in mind. So we like to use the scrum values when we think about visual thinking. So the first one is respect. And this one's super important because you are going to be incredibly critical about your drawings. Okay, when you first start, they're all gonna look horrible in your eyes. We know because we had to start somewhere too. So the trick is to respect yourself when you first start with visual thinking. Okay, don't be, don't be too hard on what you've drawn. Okay, and also when somebody else has the courage to pick up a pen and draw in front of you, respect the fact that they're trying, because this is so hard to get right in front of people. So if you're a bit worried with the first round that you do, if you come closer to our posters, you'll see that we did pencil marks in there. Because even after running this workshop a few times, Talia and I still sometimes forget what we were going to draw. So if, yeah, it's nervous <laughs> energy, right? Like even we do it. So if you want to draw something in pencil first and then you just trace over it in pen, people are going to think you're a rock star because they're going to be like, oh my word, they knew just how to draw this. Okay, so the first one is respect. Just respect yourself, respect others when you, when you first start trying. And then the next one's openness. So it's really important to Angie and I, we try to bring in this new way of thinking, using visuals. So be open with it. If you would like to, um, our contact details are in the booklet or you can reach out to us. Tweet us pictures if you do sketches, if you do sketch notes or use it in your teams. You're welcome to tweet us, you're welcome to reach out to us. So it's about being open and it's about also not taking yourself too seriously. So, you know, if you draw something that you really don't like, uh, what Angie and I do is we just put a heart on it and we're like, okay, let's love it, let's move on. Um, or label it. If you're trying to draw a frog and it looks like a blob, just right under there, frog, laugh as a team and move on. The other one is courage. It does take a lot of courage to do this. You build it up over time. So within your team, create the space where all of you can practice doing this a bit. That should be a safe space. Okay, and then commitment. So it does take time and practice. So if it is something you're interested in, just commit to practicing and, and building up your visual vocabulary. And then the final one is focus. Now, it's not focus on your drawings. Okay, <laughs> what do you think it's focusing on? Whatever Ideas. you're hearing. Okay, there's going to be a conversation and what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to capture that conversation. So don't get too absorbed in drawing your picture and you lose the conversation that's happening around you because you're trying to make your picture perfect. So focus on the conversation, build up that vocabulary, you start, you start drawing stuff, certain things really, really quickly. So then it's easy to capture the conversation, but don't lose sight of the conversation that's happening. Okay, so one last thing. We will be sharing all the photographs of the posters as our slide deck. 
We'll put it up on the conference site. And then also Angie and I are relatively active on Twitter. So Doyle underscore Angie, and I'm actually under sketching Scrum Master. Um, so we'll share links in that as well. Um, but we just hope that we've inspired you all, that we've reignited your inner child, um, and that it's something that you now feel confident and courageous to take back to your teams. I Thank don't you. know if we've got any time for questions, but Talia and I will be around after the session and we'll hang around outside a little bit as well and a little bit later on. So come find us if you've got any questions that you want to go through. But thank you very much for coming to our workshop. Thank you.